All right, we're gonna get into the <laughs> threshing floor incident. So we are in Ruth chapter three, and this is something where we really have to understand Hebrew Jewish culture. Um, think about who was reading Ruth, right? I, it's hard for us today because we look at the Bible as living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Like we, we know this, we think about this, that it's speaking to us today. <laughs> okay, true. But that verse, the, the, the word of God is living and active, means it's able to give life, meaning eternal life. <laughs> it's not that you can take whatever you read and make it mean what you want it to mean. Okay, so when we look at the book of Ruth, there's some troublesome things, right? And it's not this sweet PG, you know, or G-rated story. This is one of the stories in the Bible that has a little bit of what's going to happen here. <laughs> so when we think about who's reading it, we have to remember when it was written, it was written from the context of the people who are going to read this, right? We know that Solomon most likely wrote it in the time of David at, at minimum, right? Because we know the genealogy is in there. But when we think about an author, when somebody writes to a certain group of people, you know, when I write health topics to people who understand health or are, have been, you know, researching health, they have, there's a certain understanding that when I say oil, I mean essential oil, not car oil. You know, it's like, there's certain references that we, I may not have to dig into because I understand my audience and what they already know. So if, you know, thinking of who wrote this and, or Samuel, right? I think I said Solomon, but Samuel, thinking of him writing this and, and understanding who, who is reading it, he doesn't have to say a lot because they understood law. They understood oral tradition and written tradition. So, so this is where it gets very difficult for us not being in that culture of not being back then, not understanding oral tradition versus written tradition, like what in the world? So let's just kind of go through the characters in chapter um, three to, to kind of give us some reference. So Boaz, we might think the guy's dragging his feet a little bit. Was he traveling? I mean, it was only three months from the time they met to the time this threshing floor incident takes place. And when we think about what was going on there I, I don't know he was a wealthy man with probably a lot going on I'm sure he wasn't just hanging out watching the workers all day long you know he met he met Ruth and then probably had business to attend to the for the last three months but here's the deal about Naomi Naomi knows what's going on with barley harvest and knows that Boaz will be back during the time of actual the the the, um, the party that they throw at the end so they do this whole uh, threshing floor where they're they're um, separating the the barley pieces right so the chaff is flying in the air and it's it's a it's a mess but again when you think about the threshing floor I want you to consider like a higher place on the field somewhere somewhere close by but higher and hard packed clay with with animals right they needed oxen to tread it out and it's higher because the wind needs to be able to blow to to kind of move move the the stuff they don't want off <laughs> so the thing is what why would he need to be there well it was a common theft area so at the end of the harvest when the crops were all being taken in and and um, basically produced right got, gathered and created grain bags and whatnot there was a lot of theft and so the owner of the field would often be there and it's a big party and a whole night of feasting and and um just the end of the barley harvest and so the feasting and the drinking and it's a big party but it's there and they slept there they slept there to protect their money that was their money back then <laughs> so uh so this naomi knew so naomi had a plan like okay i know where he's gonna be and i know what's going on and when we think about this i want to give you a term that you may not be comfortable with but soft entrapment what does that mean is you know entrapment to us has such negative connotations negative denotations right it's like oh entrapment but i want you to bear with me for a minute naomi specifically asked Ruth to do three things, wash yourself, anoint yourself and get dressed in your best clothes. 
The only other area we see this is in Ezekiel 16 uh, and in context of marriage. <clears throat> so you do those three things to um, get ready for getting married. The other thing she tells her is to stay hidden. <coughs> Excuse me. She says, wait until Boaz finishes eating and drinking and don't show yourself to anyone. Like just wait, wait until he kind of goes to sleep and then go uncover his feet what and lay down okay what does ruth do she's like sure no problem okay so let me kind of give you some context here of why this is uh you know often spoken of in jewish uh commentators commentaries as this was naomi was doing this they don't use the word entrapment i'm using that word because i feel like it's something that we understand contextually, but it was common then. So again, remembering who they're writing to, if you think about um, Tamar, okay, so if you go back to Genesis, they're gonna, people back then reading Ruth know Torah, they know Genesis, they've memorized it most likely. So if you think about Genesis 38, there's this little kind of Genesis 38 is this little story stuck in between like Joseph, <laughs> Joseph kind of getting stolen. And then remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife and the whole kind of disaster there of her trying to entrap him. But there's this story of um, Judah. So the tribe of Judah is the Jewish tribe, the Jewish nation. And Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, uh, has this daughter-in-law. Remember, he had three sons. Read it if you can. It's a very interesting story. He had three sons. The first son married this woman named Tamar, and um, he was deemed wicked in the sight of God, and God struck him down, so he died. And so now, because of the law, she is supposed to be married to off to the second son. Well, the second son was mad because he didn't want an offspring to not be in his name. So remember the weird story of him, them having sex and him dropping his semen on the floor so that she wouldn't get pregnant. So God was mad, smite him down. <laughs> and then the youngest son wasn't old enough yet. And remember Judah was fearful, fearful that, oh, I don't want my third son to die too. So he says, Tamar, hey, you go back, you go back to your dad your father's house. And when my son is old enough, I'll come get you. Well, in that time, his wife dies. So now Judah is no longer married and kind of sad. And again, not thinking about Tamar. He goes into the town to do something with his sheep and sees this cult prostitute because this is now Tamar saying, oh, my father-in-law is here and he has done wrong by me. So I'm going to make things right. I'm gonna make things legally right. This is why this is so interesting. She dresses up like a prostitute, sort of, right? She covers her face, which is typical of a cult prostitute. Cult prostitutes weren't like hookers like we think today. They were uh, people who were, um, you know, like sex god, the god of sex. I mean, this is very typical back then. So not like our culture. So when you think about now her and him and her having sex with him and her saying, give me, you know, he's like, I'll, I'll give you a, an animal like as payment. She says, no, go ahead, you know, I'll send it. No, I want something of yours. So she takes like a signet, a staff and something else like a cloth or something. I can't remember the full details, but she takes these things as um, like kind of holding so that she, so that she will get paid. Well, they go back and try to pay her and she's gone, nowhere to be found. Well, a few months later, word on the street is, um, hey, Judah, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, um, has, is with child. She's pregnant and it's bad news. And he's now pissed. He's like mad that this, his daughter-in-law has been unfaithful and has, has basically prostituted herself. That's what they're assuming. Bring her to me. So she sends along the things by, by these, whoever owns these things, the goodies that he gave her, um, is who I'm pregnant by. So we think, oh, this is such a crazy story, but what happens? In verse 26, Judah says, she is more righteous than I. I'm like, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Okay, to us, but to them culturally, yes, she did the right thing where Judah didn't. 
And so those people reading Ruth would have thought about that. There would have been a reference in their mind to that. They, they understood that the law needed to happen. And Naomi was probably like, the law, like he he's one of our redeemers. This makes sense. Let's just make this happen. And so again, we might think, no, our, our sweet, sad Naomi, our sweet Ruth, they wouldn't have done this. Yes, this was pretty common. <laughs> and again, if you read these Jewish commentaries, I'll give you a few in, in just a minute that you can look up. Um, you know, it, it kind of like a, yeah, sure, no big deal. But to us, it's kind of like, mm. okay. So when we get into the different things like uncovering the feet, uh, again, from a Hebrew perspective, uncovering feet is a euphemism, which means like penis or sex, like really the euphemism of, of uncovering his feet, meaning the lower regions, which again, goes back to the story they might've thought of like um, Noah, right? Uncovering your father's nakedness. But again, his feet, there's different references in uh, Daniel to the angel covering his feet. Why would he need to cover his feet, right? It's, it's this concept of eu a euphemism, which is sexual uh, penis type of thing. Um, if you look at verse four in chapter three, um, sakab, which really means lie down, and it can be translated as just lie down, but Naomi's asking her to lie down, like, Ruth, you're going to go lie down. It often is referring to, though, in a sexual way, not just, it's, it's like, go hook up with him. It would be our, our statement of hook up. Okay, what does that really mean? <laughs> so, um, so, we think about now Ruth and we go back to her. Why did she not question any of this? There was like no question for her. And I think about that from the perspective of, well, she's not that culture. She's from Moab and their culture was very different. And also she, she's already had sex. She's not a virgin, you guys, right? She's been married before. So for her, this was probably like, okay, whatever. Tell me what to do and I'll do it, <laughs> you know? Cause so far she's been just, I trust you, Naomi. So again, this is an interesting thing. Okay. The other thing about this is that with marriage, there were three different ways um, to be married. And this is kind of a, a difficult thing for some of us because this isn't in, explicitly in the Bible, but from a Jewish tradition, there's three different ways. One is by document, one is by money, by being purchased, and one is through sex. So there's a little bit of a, a contextual thing in chapter four that we won't get into really deep now, but um, it's the oral tradition versus the written tradition. And in the oral tradition, there are some arguments that state that um, based on verse four or five, based on what the oral tradition states is that um, Ruth had already been purchased, basically not purchased with money, but with sex, right? Married on the threshing floor. Okay. Now, this is what I want to kind of help you understand here. Does that matter? The, let's make the main thing the plain thing here. <laughs> and it's all interesting. And, and what I mean by that is it's got some, some curiousness to it and some, oh, that's so weird, the culture, right? It's just so different. Um, we have to remember not to be shocked because we could be, right? There's so many things in the Bible that are very confusing and shocking. And why did they do things like that back then? <laughs> you know, um, but, but let's not have a little house on the prairie view of things. I think it's let's look at it for what it is and let the Bible interpret Bible. So when we think about the overarching theme here is not only God's plan, right? The character of these two, we know the character of both Ruth and Boaz were totally upstanding, but upstanding in which culture, right? Culturally speaking, maybe different from ours, but the redemption story is huge here, right? Understanding the redemptive story of Ruth being an outsider, being grafted in to the genealogy of Christ. And this again is where it gets interesting, what we're going to get into in chapter four next week, but we think about Tamar, right? The story of Tamar. Again, they would have thought of Tamar, her twins, one of the twins is Perez and Perez, right? Tribe of Judah is mentioned in the very last part of chapter four in Ruth and he's part of this lineage. So 
they would have been thinking of all of these stories. And I think it's just wild that this is the veracity that the, verifies the story of Christ, the lineage of Christ, the redemptive history of, of the, the total story, the, the eyes wide open story here, which is just so beautiful when you look back and say, wow, this is so cool. So that being said, I want to give you a couple places that you can look if you are interested in looking up Jewish um, commentaries, the Torah.com, JTSA.org, MyJewishLearning.com, uh, JWA.org, and ReformJudaism.org. So those are a few that are good to look at. So otherwise, I hope that this has been fun for you, and we will um, see you next week for our last one. So and we'll probably do a wrap up as well. Uh, but we'll talk soon. Take care, guys.